So, this morning, the video we're going to watch is the Good News Clubs that we had in the schools in Grandview. Um, one of the things that really excited me about this video is seeing and knowing the children over the years who have not only been exposed to the Word of God, but learned to use and to read their Bibles. Each and every one of these, these kids that you see have been equipped. And if you probably notice, we start early. We had children who were too young to read. We placed the Bibles in their hands. We partnered their, them up with what we call the Bible Buddy. Now the idea was them to work together to find the verses through sword drills. I don't know if you, remember, if you guys know what sword drills are. If you don't, you know, we have the kids who hold their Bibles up. I start with, we start off by doing books of the Bible, right? And we always tell the kids, how do you find the book that you're looking for? If you're in the library and you had a book, what do you look, what, the, what would the librarian tell you to look for? Table of contents. Right? So that's what we start out. Table of contents. All the kids, they all go to the table of contents and they look for the page number. From there, we go from book to Bible to verse. Um, and we start off by telling them, you know, we're looking for the Old Testament book, so it gives them an idea where to look. In the front of the Bible or the back of the Bible. Um... Eventually, at the end of the school year, the kids were so proficient looking for verses, they would start challenging the youth leaders and occasionally challenge me, which I was, you know, I would be so confident in my kids to take on any challenge. Each and every one of them who participated in our ministries knew their Bible. And it's so important for, that we, we, we talked about this this morning in Sunday school, which you're all welcome to come. Starts at 9 o'clock. We talked about Bible literacy. And all the kids have gone through what we've done. They all know the Bible. They know how to use it, how to read it. Right? And seeing the children and youth with open Bibles, ready and eager to learn about God, how can that not excite you? When we get to the middle school portion of the, of the video, I had a school counselor ask me, how do you get all these kids to come? Now, understand, as an un underfunded home missionary, we had no money to do a lot of fun, fun, fluffy stuff. There were two things I was able to provide the kids. One was the love of God, and two was His Word. When you see these kids in their Bibles, Ask yourself if those two things were enough. Let's uh, play the write-up. Play that.
to put the word of God word of God into the young people's hearts and if it needs to start if you would would you please open your Bibles to John chapter 13 we're going to look at verses 34 to 35 you should know how medicated I am right now I've took a lot of <laughs> This morning is a called call to love. And we're looking at John 13, 34 to 35. So it's, since I'm really overly medicated, it's going to be a fun morning. <laughs> it says, I am giving you a new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you, and that you also love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So this love, which you're looking at here, what type of love is it? In the, back, in the Bible, it usually speaks of one of four types of love. There's sorge, um, and it's in your little, I think I put them in your little papers there. Right? It's empathy, an empathy bond. There's phila. A friend bond, this eros, romantic love, and agape, unconditional God love. The word used in this verse is agapo. Now, this is the, the verb form of agape. And the verb meaning what? It's an action, right? It's an action. You do something. This quality of love is not an emotion, but an action which is exercised by willful choice. And what that means is that it's something spontaneous, something that's acted out of instinct. It's not force, it's natural. Something we don't have to think about. What Jesus is doing here, he's calling the disciples back to basics. Now, I really want you to think about this. <clears throat> Please think about this, right? If we're unable to love one another with this kind of love, here, within that household of faith, in our home, here, first of all, how can we expect to love others, meaning the lost that are out there? Then two, how can we say we love God? Let's flip our Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. Verses 7 to 11. Oops. First John 4. 7 to 11. Beloved, let's love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, because God is love. By this, the love of God was revealed in us 
that God was sent, I'm mean, sorry, that God has sent his only son into the world that, that we may live through him. And this is love. Not that God loved, but that God loved us. I'm mean, sorry, not that we love God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be a preparation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We ask that this morning, that your word will come alive to us, that penetrate our hearts, Heavenly Father, and help us to see the things that we're, and where we're at in our lives. The reflection, Heavenly Father, that we should have. And on, upon reflecting, make the, um, the right adjustments that we need to do to be in line with you, to come in your glory, Heavenly Father, to glorify you with our lives. We ask that this morning you would watch our, our, our walk with you and guide us through your word. Amen. So, right there in the verse that we just read, there's both forms of agape, right? A noun form and a verb form. What does it tell us? We didn't love because he loved, we didn't love, he didn't love us because we loved him. The truth is that we, at one time of our lives, were enemies of God and we hated him. But you know, he loved us in spite of who we were and demonstrated this great love for us by sending his son to settle the payment for the debt of our sin. And to reconcile us to himself. To bring us, bring us to the right relationship to him. So if God loved us in this manner, and he demonstrated it to us, he showed us it wasn't just talk. How should we love one another here in our home? If you're a parent... You love your ch children very much. How would you feel if your kids were always at each other's throats, fighting like cats and dogs? Or maybe not even that. Maybe they just ignore each other, indifferent to each other, meaning that they don't really show love to one another. Would this make you happy? What kind of love would you want them to have for each other? Wouldn't you want them to have the love that you showed to them? All right, so let's look at verses 12 to, 12 to 16. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us. And his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we remain in him and he in us because he has given us his, of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God remains in him, and he in God. We have come to know and believe that the love which God has for us, God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. So, let me explain. Because we are humans, and we're selfish and self-seeking, this uh, love that God blesses us with isn't with the intent for us to hoard this love to ourselves. We're not the terminal, but the channel. That means that this love that we receive, right, it's supposed to be poured out through us to others. We are partakers of the Spirit. In verse 15 there, it says, this confession that Jesus is the Son of God. It's not merely an intellectual acceptance, but a confession which involves a commitment of yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. But what does this actually mean? And I want you to visualize. 
you have a sponge, right? What happens when the sponge, when it's not in water? It gets hard and about that thick, right? Then you have, I'm, not, I'm talking about a real sponge, not those synthetic ones, a real sponge, right? It's flat and dry. You get a bowl of water and you put water in it. And you put that sponge in the, in the water, what happens to the sponge? It expands. So that's what we are. We're the sponge. And Jesus Christ is the living water. See, when you put that sponge in the water, the sponge, the water becomes part of the sponge, and the water and the sponge becomes part of the water. It's all one thing. I mean it's separate, but if they squeeze it, the water comes out. But we don't want to be squeezed, right? <laughs> That's what we're talking about here. We want to be filled with that living water. This is how your commitment to Christ is. Now, if I'm going to be in fellowship with God, I must love those whom He loves. Not only that, but in the same manner that He loves. Because it isn't... <clears throat> it isn't our love that is made perfect but God's love made perfect through us, within us. And I know it's something kind of complicated, and it's going to get worse. But so far, does it make sense? <clears throat> the thing is, I feel we're still missing something. Something which we haven't grasped. What is it that we could, which we, we are missing? We could be missing. Could, we be, could it be that what we're missing is that we don't fully understand that this first step of love is not towards people, it's towards God. Could it be that to be able to love, we first need to receive? Receiving from Him, what? Forgiveness, mercy, grace and love it's only then and then only then when we receive these things from God that we can truly be capable of giving it to others allowing these things to flow out of us into others let's jump to verse 19 And Pam covered this. We love because he loved us first. So receiving from him forgiveness, mercy, grace, and love, once we receive these things from him, shouldn't we exercise these things to others? As a matter of fact, I'm going to go better. I'm going to say that when you receive these things from God, you can't help these things to flow out of you. It happens. And if, there's not, if it's not happening, there's a disconnect. Let's look at Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. Here it tells us what we should be. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. We are to be imitators. It's like standing in front of the mirror and seeing the reflection. That reflection in the mirror mirrors our movements. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to reflect God in our lives. So what does that mean? We are called to love. To walk in love. If we are forgiven, then what, we sh what should we do? But you know, it's really hard for people because they don't forgive. 
and hatred forms in their hearts. And what are we told about that? Going back to 1 John 4, looking at verses 20 and 21. First John 4, 20, 21. If someone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother or sister, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother and sister, whom he has seen, cannot love a God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God must also love his brother and sister. You know, when we think of forgiveness, forgiveness isn't easy. But you know, we're not promised by God anywhere that anything will be easy. But it's something we need to be, that needs to be done. Forgiving. When you forgive, that load comes off of you. To forgive isn't for that other person, it's to offload your burden what you're carrying. And don't get confused. Forgiving doesn't mean forgetting. And we've all heard the saying, forgive and forget. No, we're called to have sound minds. Using discernment. Making wise decisions. Not acting foolishly. You might think, well, we're supposed to forgive and forget. Say if a girl got raped, <clears throat> she, forget, she, she forgives the rapist. Should she forgive, forget what he did to her? She should use discernment and know it's probably not wise to be around him. Right? When you forgive, it means you give everything to God. Your hurt, your pain, your fear, your anger, all the things you carry, because all you do when you're carrying this stuff is you hurt yourself. And when you do this, it doesn't matter what that other, that other person, if they never even acknowledge what they did to you. Because you place your faith and trust in God that he's going to handle it. We need to have that trust and faith that God is ju a just God. And just handle things, handle things, hand things over to him. <clears throat> because if you don't, what happens? And I've talked with a number of you about this. We're saved. We have our old self. We have our new self. Our old self is over our shoulder. If we keep looking at the past, looking at the past, looking at the past, we're chained to the past. And we can't continue into, the, into our new selves. You need to let go of that stuff. How can you say, oh, you know what? I hate my dad. And say you love Christ. You can't hate like that and say you love Christ. Because you're chained to that stuff. You need to give it over to him. You know, my relationship with my dad, you know, he was a pretty physical guy and stuff. And <clears throat> I, I was hurt for a long time. And I forgave him even though he didn't really acknowledge. He acknowledged once and then he went back to the way he was. But I forgave him and gave it to God. And you know when he died? I didn't, I didn't feel that stuff carrying on me because I gave it to God. It's, it's a big, you know, it's like a, oh, all that stuff's lifted off. It doesn't bother you no more. Because that's what we're, we're supposed to do. Give those things to God. Let Him carry those. It's the same with mercies and grace. Because we receive these things from God, we should extend them to others. Like I said, it isn't easy, but these are the things we need to do if we're committed to Christ. Not through obligation, but through love and obedience. 
To love is a choice. It isn't a feeling. And you know it's our human nature that we tend to be reactive in this, meaning that we respond only to love. We, we respond to love only to things that are beautiful, nice, charming, and good. But we are called to live a life of love. And make no mistake, it's a choice that each of us need to make. Our love must be proactive and also thoughtful. In Matthew 5, 43 to 47. Matthew 5, 43 to 47. You have heard, heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may prove yourselves to be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends the rains on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even tax collectors, do they not do the same? And if you greet only your brother or sister, what more are you doing than others? Even Gentiles do the same. What is it we should be doing? Who is it that we should be loving? Here we are in our home. How do we treat others in our house, here? Do we love one another as we ought? Have you forgiven? Have you shown mercies and grace to one another? How are you treating your own brothers and sisters who sit here with us under the same roof? I'm asking that you reflect upon the treatment of one another. You think, well, I don't treat anyone bad. Okay, you might not treat anyone bad. But let me point something out to you. Being indifferent to somebody is just as bad. Now again, I'm not casting stones. I'm tossing pebbles to wake you up. People say, well, I really don't know them. During coffee time, after service, make an effort. I know you want to sit with your friends and shoot the breeze, but why not, why not sit with a person you don't know very well? Remember, it's about building relationships and building our relationship with God and with each other. You won't regret this. I had somebody visit me yesterday and we were talking about how the church used to be back in the day. Back in those days, I wasn't a believer, so, uh, but I saw the church was family. Church was together. Everyone helped each other out. You know, the, the pastor that, that, you know, his name was Don Jackson, or his name is Don Jackson, you know, in Manchester, he showed me that, you know what, he'd get people together, hey, Keith, somebody's moving, all right, let's, who has trucks? And he'd be out there helping out and stuff. He was always helping out. Family does things together, spends time together, encourages each other, lifts each other up, helps each other when they're fallen. All too often in the churches today, people come, sit, go to the coffee hour, and then leave. There's no gathering of the saints. Just because we're here in the same room doesn't mean we're gathering. 
We need to be in each other's lives. You know, sometimes there are relationships here in church are like faith, Facebook friends. They're not really friends. Oh, I have 10,000 friends. Do you know each and every one personally? No, but they're my friends. They're not your friends. They're acquaintances. Here in church, these are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Someone might, may say to me that's outside, oh, you're new in our town. You know what? I, must, I might be new to your town, but I'm not new to the, the body of Christ. When we first came here in October, was it October? Um, no, the first time we came. I think it was June. Tony's, um, Tony's dad, Grace's brother, we never met any of you before. And Hap was telling me, you know, they had the parade, and Hap was taking me down the parade and meeting people. And her, his brother, I mean, his dad, Grace's brother, said, do you know all these people? No? But, but it's just like you know them. Why is that? Because we have the bond of Christ in our lives. We have something in common. We're brothers and sisters. Doesn't how, no matter how far I came, you treated me like a brother, and I treated you like a brother and a sister. There was that love that he even he saw, which was, was you know, it's a good testimony that he saw that. These are things we need to address. Because there are things that we need to cast away. Now, you can say you dislike someone or be indifferent to someone, but are you following God? And this is where I'm going with this. Our goal, our desire is to make disciples. If our standard is no higher than the world's, we can be sure that we can never make an impact in our community here in Bonanza. I'm not trying to be critical, I'm trying to be real. If we're family under one roof, and we don't have the love that we should have for one another, how are we going to share and reach others in the name of Christ? We shouldn't have things that separate us. Because we have that in common, what brings us together, our Lord Jesus Christ. So let me ask you, turn your Bibles to Acts 2, 42 to 47. When you look at this, and as we read it, I want you to see and feel and, and look at how this church was. Acts 2, 42 to 47. They were continually devoted, devoting themselves to the apostles' teachings and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone kept feeling the sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all the believers were together and had all things in common. And they would sell their properties and possessions and share them with all, to the extent that anyone that anyone had needed, day by day, continuing continuing in one with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincere heart, praising God and having favor with the people. And the Lord was adding their, to their numbers day by day, day those who were being saved. Here we have the early church. What do we see? The people coming together. There was a, a sense of feeling of awe as they met. They continued with one mind, telling me where their, where their focus was. What was their focus? On God. And they were living to glorify God. It gave this gladness and sincere sincerity of heart. It gave them favor with people. 
people saw them and they're like, well, I want to have that. And people were being saved. And this is what I'm, I, I want to ask. Is this possible to attain here at Bonanza Community Church? We can attain this together, but it starts from within, from us. We need to exercise the agape love with one another here. It's an action, something we do. This quality of love is not an emotion, but the action which is exercised by willful choice, which means that it's something spontaneous, something that's acted upon in, with instinct. Not forced, it's natural. Something we don't have to think about. Let's put this in action here in our church. It can be done. Before I step down this morning, I need to do this. I would like to make sure that all the men in the church know about breakfast on Saturdays. <laughs> this Saturday we have breakfast. It's a fun time of fellowship. And it's not um, Mike's doing the, 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 the Bible study. It's, we're not, he has his Bible study prepared, but like last time, there was an issue. And he left that Bible study and he dealt with that issue that one of the men had. It's not, we're not teaching lessons, we're teaching God's uh, word to others. And, and touching men's lives. Sometimes men get out of control. <laughs> but Mike reels them back in. <laughs> and I encourage all the men to come at 8 o'clock, where we gather here in the, in the gym, to come and fellowship together. Come love one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for your word. We ask, Heavenly Father, and as we're all under one roof here with our brothers and sisters in Christ, that we would love one another and get to know one another and encourage one another and be like this Acts Church, Heavenly Father, where the believers all came together in gladness and joy. And they just were at awe because all you've done in their lives we ask Heavenly Father, just lead us and guide us in this, in this way that we can make a difference, not only here in our church, but in our community here in Bonanza. That we reach, that the lost would look at us and say, that's what I want. I want to have that love. And then come and be saved. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for just being patient with us and just guiding us through our lives. We pray these things in your precious name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.